will defend these police officers. Listen to police officers' commands, listen to what we tell you, and just stop. The nation needs to realize that when we tell you to do something, do it. And if you're wrong, you're wrong. If you're right, then the courts will figure it out. We don't get to take the law. We enforce it. But at the end of the day, each and every man is to go home safe. Sometimes the use of force is necessary. You need to comply with the police officer the way the system was meant to be. Comply with the orders of police officers. Resisting arrest is a real and dangerous crime. A nonpartisan liberty for all. I'm your host, Dave Bourne. I'm sorry, I kind of lost it there for a sec. Um, As I woke up late, uh, I didn't mean to go to sleep actually at all. I laid down. Then I wake up and it's 10 of 7, so I apologize for that. I'm like, Dave Bourne, no, nonpartisan liberty for all, and I'm your host, Dave Bourne, and it is December 2nd, 2015, and we're coming to you live from Las Vegas, Nevada. Thank you for tuning in. We're on weeknights Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday at 7 o'clock Pacific, 10 o'clock Eastern. And you can listen on Spreaker.com and NonpartisanLibertyForAll.com. We promote the ideas of true freedom and liberty, meaning being able to do whatever you want as long as you respect the freedom of others and don't directly interfere with their freedom, as well as exposing government for what it is, a mafia based on extortion that rules without consent by threat of force and violence. And again, I apologize for that uh, mistake. I, I think it was that I was plugging the phone in and I had turned it on and I thought that I had it on silent and i have said before how on my show you don't hear sounds coming from well i was referring more to computers and programs like i'll hear on other shows like their facebook notify notification go off and hear a sound from that or something along those lines. And I was saying one day how you'll never hear that on my show, and you actually won't because I have everything set up where certain things are muted and whatnot, and it maintains those setups. But the phone, I guess, is a different thing, and I had my phone on actually on ring and now i have it on this stupid ring because i have an issue now with my storage uh card and i lost everything that was on that so it just went to one of the default rings that sounds really stupid and i don't know why i'd even have it on ring but anyway uh that's kind of what happened there so i'm still in that half well i'm not half asleep i'm awake but you know when you you're in that kind of state of uh i just woke up 10 minutes ago and i'm on the air this <laughs> state uh which is not the best day to be in. So, so, again, I actually didn't even plan on falling asleep. Uh, last night, I did an extra hour. I was on till 11, and then I don't think I fell asleep till 1230. I get up at 545 or something. I have my alarm set for 545. Actually, I have two alarms. I, I have one that goes off at 530. And I have one that goes off at 545. And I don't really need to get up at the one at 530. But that's like my prepare myself 
alarm. And then I have my actual, okay, I have to get up now alarm. And then maybe I can wait five minutes on that. And then I have to get up if I want to be at work on time. There are a few things that I want to talk about today. Um, along with what was listed in the event, there was a shooting in San Bernardino, California. I'll talk a little about that, but not a lot, because I don't like to give things like that a lot of attention unless I somehow relate it to uh, the promotion of freedom and liberty. And there's one thing really I want to focus on when it comes to that. Of course, I feel bad for all the people that were, I believe there were 14 people that were killed and 17 or so that were injured. And it it seems like they know a lot of stuff, but they're holding it back and that it's probably a terrorist attack. So initially, I didn't think anything of, is this a false flag or something like that? Because I I knew, and I've said this before, that, okay, if something happens here, I know that or I'm going to think I don't know anything for sure so I'm not going to I'm not going to sit there and say well I know like you know act like I know for sure what happened but I'm going to think that the CIA and ISIS had something to do with it definitely especially if it's something similar to what had happened in France and it seems that a lot of people use AK-47s. I guess it's just internationally the most popular gun. I mean, I, I even have one. I have a cheaper one. I want to get an actually a uh, better American-made one. I believe that you still can't get a Russian-made one because Obama with the sanctions with Russia, of course, uses as an excuse to ban another gun. And he had come out and made a statement, and we'll get to that uh, in a little while here as far as what he had to say. And you know that, of course, it's not going to miss an opportunity to exploit an event, to push an agenda. But... I, I don't understand the place. It, it, I read a couple articles about it, where it happened. I know when it happened. I guess it happened at 11 in the morning. It's something about a Christmas party. I don't know if they were having a Christmas party and they mentioned somebody getting mad and coming back, but they don't know if that's the same person. I would say probably not because it sounds like there were three people they're saying that were involved. And that's when you don't see a lot of uh, those types of shootings with that many people involved unless it's thoroughly planned out and it's done for some kind of reason. I mean, if it's like a robbery or something, yeah. Um, but you kind of hear more about those (laughs) robberies like that in the movies than in reality, even, uh, probably with shootings like that, but usually you'll have a lunatic lone gunman type scenario where, uh, especially in, uh, school shootings where, And a lot of times is school shootings. And and I think one school shooting or the promotion of school shootings promote more school shootings. It's just where it happens at. So I think there are a lot of 
scenarios where they were actually targeting a specific person and they just happened to do it at school as opposed to someplace else. And doesn't mean that the whole school was in danger. So there's still not a lot of information out there. I have a short clip from, I believe, the chief of police somewhere. Or did I not get that clip? No, I might. Oh, uh, yeah, it's only a fifty-three second uh, clip. So here's a chip, the chip. <laughs> here's a clip from the chief of police. Uh, this is only fifty-three uh, seconds, so I'll play this real quick. Authorities in San Bernardino, California, have described a deadly scene at a social... What the fuck was up with that music at the beginning? <laughs> I'm going to play that again. It's like, who, who the fuck put this thing together? Shit. Authority. It, it sounds like a training video. Like, when you have some kind of training video or something on a specific subject... Uh, like that kind of music uh, for a class. Like you're watching a video for some kind of class you're taking and do 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 here's the here's the video. He's in San Bernardino, California have described a deadly scene at a social services center as a targeted mission. Citing witnesses to the Wednesday shooting in Southern California, upwards of three gunmen fired upon a banquet, killing at least 14 people. Over a dozen others were wounded, 10 of whom were classified in critical condition. The San Bernardino police chief stated the attackers came prepared to do what they did. Jared Bergwan added that the attackers likely... No, they came unprepared to do what they did. Really? Uh, I know they did mention uh, some stuff about bombs as well. But let me uh, play the rest of this. It's only 30 more seconds. Wielded rifles and shotguns, though no weapons were recovered at the scene. According to the president and CEO of the center, the shooting took place in a conference area which hosted a banquet for the San Bernardino County Department of Public Health. Okay. I don't want to hear that stupid music at the end. It's weird because, and I think I have one more clip. I have to find that I have one of the president, but I think I have one with the, yeah, I'll play that in a little while because it, it's, it's weird. It almost sounds like the, there was an SUV and there was a standoff with an SUV and it almost sounds like it's possible the the way they described it. And they didn't go into a lot of detail, but they almost made it sound like it could possibly be two different things. There's something going on with an SUV, and then there's something going on with people that actually did the shooting. So I don't know what really happened. They weren't too descriptive. I saw part of the press conference. I, of course, saw the fucking morons uh, on Fox News along with uh, the other moron there who I, I talk about uh, who's on the radio when I drive home from, from I was going to say school, like when I drive home from school, I'm driving home from high school, uh, Mark Levin and his asinine, I won't say his asinine ass, but they all bring up Greta Van Susteren and her stupid ass guest, who's a lawyer. You know, we have to thank the police on this one because, you know, people say all this stuff about the police and, you know, looks, here's an example where the police did a good job and we needed them. Well, first of all, I, I, I don't know whether they did a good job or not. They had a fucking shootout with a van or a uh, SUV, okay, and they killed two of the people. 
So it doesn't say anything. It, it it seems like from the information that I got that they were leaving. So they were there after the crime happened and then they did a shelter in place and this is this is a quote I believe um or pretty close to it the chief of police basically said People were told to shelter in place in this one specific neighborhood that they locked down and they searched the neighborhood. And that reminds me of, of course, the Boston bombing, because I don't know what they did in that neighborhood. I don't know if they went door to door. Now, you got to remember, this is California, where just like Massachusetts, most people are not armed. So they probably know i'd say in california more people are armed than in massachusetts and i'd say that probably though not in so this is san bernardino more southern california so because i would say more northern california from what i understand but i i, I don't know cuz then you have san francisco the san francisco area too so Maybe in general, uh, it's about the same. But California is a bigger state population-wise, of course. You could fit, I don't know how many Massachusetts is in California. So I, I, I don't know. But I would say that California has some of the strictest gun laws in the country. And, of course, it didn't stop anybody from getting any guns in this Scenario, And if this is a quote unquote terrorist attack, I would assume that they got guns that were not traceable and they didn't go into a store and just buy them. Although either way, does it really matter? I guess if their plans were, I guess it depends on what their plans were. If they thought they were going to get away, then probably they would have wanted untraceable guns if this was like a we don't care suicide type mission I, I don't know i guess there's not enough information out there but blaming having the guns on the gun laws when california has some of the strictest gun laws in the country i think is bullshit and of course what does the president do right away? Well, he brings up the gun laws. And the one that he's starting to bring up now and put in people's head, it heads, it's like he's planning this out as he's starting to put the idea out there. But I've heard this for years. I don't know if it was even originally from him. I think it was, though, years ago. But then he didn't really say much about it for a while, and then he brought it up again. But having people on the no-fly list being able to buy a gun, because really what you're saying is, I'm just making a list of fucking people that I don't want to have a gun. Why don't they just have a no-gun list? Because the no-fly list is based off of nothing. And when I say based off of nothing, what I mean is, they can put anybody on there without going through any kind of process where you get to defend yourself, you get to go to court. Not like any of that matters anymore because even with the courts, you don't have any freedoms. And if you look at, there was a case in New Hampshire with uh, Derek J. Freeman, and he was only arrested for misdemeanors. And it was like stupid misdemeanors. If you have ever seen uh, Derek J's victimless crime spree, which I, I did actually like. And he took it all the way to the Supreme Court because they wouldn't give him a permit to carry. He could get a gun, fine. He could open carry in New Hampshire, but they wouldn't give him a permit to carry. And it's a shall, I believe it's a shall issue state like Nevada, where 
essentially, as long as you're not a felon, they they give it to you. They don't try to go through all your background and all that shit. It's just, I mean, they do a background check, but it's basically if you pass a background check to buy a gun, then you should be able to get a permit to carry. That's pretty much what it is. And they denied him because of his arrest and his issues with the Keen police. And really, it was the Keen police harassing him. But it was it was just like stupid shit, most of it. And it was nothing violent. It was nothing that was a felony. And he had ended up just going to jail over it because it was so many, it was a bunch of misdemeanors and the way they structure sentencing, he could have ended up in jail probably for like 20 years. It's insane for the stuff he did, which again was basically nothing. So he took it all the way to the uh, New Hampshire Supreme court. Sorry. I think I said Supreme court. And, of course, they ruled against him. So when it comes to courts, and I've had my fair share of experience with courts as well, uh, especially nowadays, it's pretty much the court is on the side of the government and they're going to do whatever they can to help find you guilty whether you are guilty or not. Now, you do have exceptions, of course. Occasionally, you might have a judge who will actually follow the law, but the majority of them will not, unless you have it on, like, videotape or something. But you have to... They're going to take the word of the state over yours. The state will have more credibility. Police will have more credibility than you, no matter what. Even though you could have this uh, impeccable reputation compared to the officer, it doesn't matter. Because as far as they're concerned, you've been accused of something and that means right there, then obviously you don't have a impeccable uh, reputation because what a cop's word is like every other person, it may be all these you know, important people or all these people that uh, don't have any records and are well respected in the community that that speak up for you, and, but it doesn't matter. And, well, I guess unless they're part of the system themselves, then maybe it will matter. But for the most part, unless it's some elite uh, person, it doesn't matter. So the point being that even if you went through court for this process to get on this list, would it really matter? But what they're doing is they're, they would be violating the Second Amendment and they would be violating the right to due process because they're, which they're already doing. And I don't know what a lawyer's opinion would be on this, but if there's any lawyers out there who would like to uh, call in that are listening, which probably not, but just in case, uh, 702-470-7664. That's 702-470-7664. And anybody else, of course, who would like to call in with their opinion. Or you can call in or Skype in, uh, send a contact request to Nonpartisan Liberty for All. It's all one word. But, and then give your you know, name and where you're from and what you want to talk about. And I would do the same if you call in text first with your name and what you want to talk about, where you're from. But I would say that never mind 
putting you on a list that stops you from buying a gun, even right now where they have a no fly list and you don't have to be convicted of any crime. You don't even have to know if you're on this list and how they come to the conclusion of who's on the list or not. I don't know, but they can put anybody they want on this list. And I'm sure they have tons of lists uh, now because of course of terrorism and all of this shit. So, who knows how many lists they have, but those lists and, and they may be doing other things based on other lists. It's just not stopping you from flying or doing anything that you're aware of. So this no fly list, how is that not constitutional? And has anybody challenged that to the Supreme court? Again, the Supreme Court is not much better than a regular court. Sometimes, in in some cases, worse because their cases are looked at and scrutinized by the whole country as far as a case like that you would hear about. Whereas most cases in a district court, you wouldn't. So they know they're, you know, scrutinized and that it sets precedent and all of these things. And all they need is a five to four, you know, five people got to vote uh, one way. They just need majority to rule one way or the other. But I don't know that anybody's ever filed. I would think that they would have that you go to get on a plane and you can't. And I know some people was mix up where they had a similar name. And that shows how much they even know about the people that they're putting on the list. But because they should have more information than just a name, uh, name and at least a birth date and maybe some other information for the state you live in or something. Um, but that sounds like something that would be unconstitutional to now if the airlines themselves, but I, I I would consider that coercion or uh, pressuring. Anytime it comes to the government, like I had told this example before, uh, but I think it's an important example, so I will tell it again on my website, and it gives me a uh, opportunity to promote my uh, Facebook page. Not my website. The website's nonpartisanlibertyforall.com, but my Facebook page which is facebook.com slash nonpartisan liberty for for all. I had a cop one time who somehow got on there and he had said he was kind of a douchebag. So he fits the uh, basic (laughs) definition or personality type of police, right? But he had said that, oh, it's a free market, because I had said something about that, that I I forget exactly how I said it, but I had looked at it as it's not a free market situation, it's free speech or something like that. And he had said... Well, it's free market, so I can say whatever. But what I said to him, and and I think this was talking about maybe getting rid of the cop block page because they were trying to get rid of the cop block page. They were trying to get cop block labeled as a hate group, and and they probably still are. They being you know police associations all over the country. And and I don't know if there's like one main 
police association. I know Obama started something after Ferguson, but I don't know how concerned they are with groups like Cop Lock. I'm sure they are concerned with them, though. But my point was, well, it's not the same thing because when you have the police pressuring you, that's a, that's a whole different story because that is almost like extortion where you're threatening a website like Facebook to take something down. Now, of course, Facebook is too big for it to matter and a local police department or even a county or state police association is not going to get something taken down from Facebook. But, I mean, they could, but it's not going to be based on the fact that Facebook is intimidated by them, I would say. But I still would view it that way, that the fact that the police are the ones asking for you to do it And they're doing it based on the fact that they're telling you they're the police. To me, that's a threat. So it's not, it's different than just a free market, a regular person asking, oh, can you take this page down? Because Facebook is a private company. So I was saying that Facebook taking down cop block or taking down my page or taking down any page based on the police asking them to would be violating that person's rights because they're being coerced into doing it because the police are asking them. So that was my point with that. And I think it's a very valid point when you have the police. Now, if they were asking as a private citizen and they didn't know they were the police or associated with the police, then that's different. But once they were doing everything as police and they were trying to intimidate people and it's just, it's so fucked up because it was just over the internet and they were mad because they don't want people to know what, they do they want to be able to get away with whatever they do because supposedly they do great things like today they had these fucking conservative fuckheads like mark levin and greta van sustren and whoever was on uh her show this lawyer that's on all the time uh who's uh black i'm just saying that he's black so you might know who he is because she has the same guy. He's bald. Um, She has the same guy on the show a lot, at least when I used to watch it years ago. So that's just a description to give people a description of, you may know who he is, because I don't remember his name. So he said the same thing, and he's like, he had said that, I'm glad you said that. And the same with Mark Levin. There was some guy from Westwood One, that had said the same thing and I'm just sitting there like one how does that one incident now let's assume that you think they did a great job and and whatnot now one incident is not gonna change anything as far as I'm concerned and I don't even know what the if whether they did a good job or not I know they killed two people So they may have been within the, their right. It may have been justifiable because they had talked about a gun fight, I guess, but I don't know if the police started firing at them first and how, and even the difference between the van incident and how they know that those were the same people if they even were and there's not enough real details that are out there but if they were being shot at even though I don't I don't believe the police should exist but 
as a person, if they're being shot at, then fine. They have the right to shoot back in that situation. But saying that, well, they saved all the people in the neighborhood and they did a great job and, you know, people need to thank them because we need police and look at uh, all the they put their lives in danger. So one incident that probably might be the only incident of their careers ever that they're involved in where they have somebody shooting at them because of that. Now, all of a sudden, what, what does that even mean? Now I would say that you don't know all the circumstances anyway, And I still wouldn't need police in that situation. I don't know how they come to that conclusion either. Because, yes, in California, most of these people don't have guns. But in Nevada, a lot of people do have guns. And if there was a criminal in my neighborhood running around with a gun and he tried to get in my house with his gun pointed at me or uh, tried something with his gun. Trust me. Once I heard there was somebody in the neighborhood that was supposedly a wanted fugitive that was shooting at people or killed 14 people, I'd be ready for that. So I wouldn't be worrying about it. And what are the police going to do that I can't do? And the only difference would be is they can call more police. I've seen a lot of these cops. They look really out of shape. Now, granted, <laughs> I would admit I'm probably not in the best shape, and I'm not saying that I look bad. Um, at least I I look fine with my clothes on. <laughs> but I look skinnier than I actually am with my clothes on. But that aside... There's not really much that a cop could do that I can't. Uh, I can shoot at people too. So I don't know how them uh, coming to the neighborhood would help me or make me feel any better. It would actually make me feel worse because what if they mistake somebody for a suspect or for the person they're looking for and they shoot them. Of course, in California, I believe you can't open carry. So, um, but if that was the situation, I would definitely be, if I went outside at all, I would definitely be open carrying. And of course they tell people, and this is how, this is what they want people to get used to as well, the shelter in place. So they made an announcement as I had mentioned earlier, um, or actually, I don't know if I, uh, left this out or not that, uh, but I believe I said this. Yeah. That they told people to shelter in place and they locked down and searched the neighborhood. I don't know exactly what that means. Hopefully we'll find out more information about quote unquote locked down and search the neighborhood if they went door to door. And it's fine if they go and knock on somebody's door. It is not fine if they force themselves in or they're told that they can't come in and they just go in anyway. That is not okay. I don't care what the situation is. And obviously, again, this is one guy that is potentially armed but that doesn't that doesn't give them the right to just come in your house now some people are glad i I even heard an interview with a woman who said oh she's glad that the police are there and she loves the police and all that bullshit you know i have grandkids or whatever so she doesn't realize when they get a little older, you know, they, they might get beaten up by them or harassed by them or the worst possible uh, scenario uh, shot and killed by them. So 
to use this as a example of what cops go through is such a not lie but distortion of reality because this rarely happens and you got to fucking remember and I I hate to say you have to do this or you have to do that because you don't have to do anything but in this case I'll say you have to remember or this is a fact so I guess you don't have to remember it but 300 million people that's a lot of people the united states is the third biggest country population wise in the world there are way too many people to be under one government so although it's still tragic when 14 people get killed in the big scheme of things and this sounds cold-hearted That's not a huge amount of of people in relation to how many people die every day. More people than that die every day. And I feel bad for these people because obviously when it's a situation where, or their families, because when I believe when you're dead, you know, you're dead, so... I feel bad that they didn't get to experience their lives or the rest of their lives. And of course I feel, I feel worse for the families because they're the ones that are left behind. But at the same time, you have to put things in perspective as far as, there being more people on a daily basis that die. Now this is more of a tragic type thing because I know you can, you look at it and say, well, this didn't have to happen. If these people didn't do this, then this wouldn't have happened. And it's a direct result of the actions of a couple people. And I realized that. So it is different in that sense. But there are tragic deaths every day. And I think what happens is stories like this get way overblown when not that these people aren't important, but what about all the other people that died? Or what about the people uh, when when was this like a month ago or less than that or the doctors without borders where i think 25 doctors got uh, killed from a bomb from the US government so are, are these those people less important and they were actually I don't know where these doctors were from, but from what I understand, Doctors Without Borders are from all over the world. Uh, I don't know how many were from the United States, but are they less important because they were from another country? They were bombed by the U.S. government, by a government, not three... uh, potential terrorist again the all the facts aren't in and i haven't looked at the news in maybe i guess now probably a couple hours but it's like they're of course not as important because it's here and then you have um Obama come out and to like the people on the East Coast, I would say, what is the difference? Because when things happen now, I'm in Las Vegas. So San Bernardino is not that far from me. Maybe like I, well, I'm not sure exactly where it is. I know it's in Southern California, but L.A. is like four hours. So it's not that far. But like Sandy Hook, for example, and there's still a lot of questions around what 
the real story was. And I actually, to be honest, have questions about the real story because of the investigator who, as a living, investigated school security and things like that and was threatened and couldn't get information. And I, I, I don't think it was a something that didn't happen where people will say, well, it was just a whole fake thing and it didn't, a staged event. I, I don't know how you can stage an event with th that many people dying. That th That is hard for me to believe. Now, where you can change the facts and have a patsy and that type thing, uh, I definitely believe in that. That's but the staging an event where it's fake, where nobody actually died, uh, that's kind of hard for me to believe. But oh, who knows? Uh, but I do believe there are still some questions around Sandy Hook. But my point was, what does what happened in Sandy Hook have to do with the laws in Nevada? So after that, of course, they wanted to pass all these laws on a federal level and they changed laws in Connecticut and New York and Massachusetts and a lot of places. But what does it have to do with Nevada? Nothing. So it might as well be fucking England or France. I mean, Nevada is like 3000 miles away from fucking Connecticut. Now it is in the same country but the way the country was set up is the states are supposed to have more power than they obviously do. And, of course, you have the Second Amendment as well. But but because it's in the same country, it means more. So that's where, but that doesn't even matter anymore because then what happens in France, they ramp up, of course, security here because of what happens happened in France. They ramp up security in, say, New York, which I, I think was kind of ridiculous. But, of course, the first thing you have Obama come out and say is he talks about we need to... We need to change the gun laws because that's, you know, that's what it is. If you just make a couple changes, everything will be fine. And yeah, which is which is bullshit. But let me play the clip of him uh, reacting to the him hearing about the shooting. And this is before he even knows whether it's a terrorist uh, attack or I don't even know how much how many details he had. Not that they're going to keep anything from him, but I don't know how many details the police had to give him or the FBI. I, I don't know how they how that works, how they were getting those uh, details to him. But I don't think whoever was giving him all the details had all of the details at that point because when I pulled this video it said it was from four hours before that and I think I pulled it around five o'clock uh, pacific time and it happened at 11 o'clock pacific time so this is you know an hour after or a couple hours after so I'm going to play that and then I'm going to play a clip it's a quick clip as well of what happened in the standoff. I don't know if that's more of just uh, footage as opposed to commentary because I didn't get a chance to listen to that, but hopefully it is. And then we will be uh, right back after this. Uh, nonpartisan liberty for all.com. Be sure to check us out there. And again, if you'd like to call in with your comments, I'm trying to really encourage people to call in, especially since 
I've been doing this show now by myself for the most part. Uh, Ken Shorgen will be joining us tomorrow. And he has joined us every other Thursday. And I had a Shire dude on one day, and he'll, he's going to join us next Tuesday. And I am looking for another co-host, but I, I don't really know even how people, what people's opinion is. I would assume that listening to the same person the whole time gets boring. I don't know. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe some people like me. Uh, maybe they don't. Maybe they listened because of the co-host I had or when I used to have guests, which I could get back to getting guests if I wanted to and doing interviews. And that's a possibility as well. But uh, since I am doing the shows, many of the shows now by myself until I get some new co-hosts and it's hard to find people that are, are good enough at the same time, uh, especially when you're not paying them. So I'm trying to encourage people to call in if you're listening live and you have a thought, then call in, uh, share it. Uh, I know some people, the biggest reason that people say that they don't call in is they get nervous. Well, don't worry. Not a lot of people are listening. So don't worry about calling in. So again, the number is 702-470-7664. That's 702-470-7664. And you can find all that information at the website, nonpartisanlibertyforall.com. All the uh, on Contact Us, if you click on that, and I believe it's even on the front page. And you can always Skype in, and it sounds better. Just send a contact request, and then uh, send me a message and let me know your name and where you're calling from and what you want to talk about. So I encourage anybody who actually has, if you're sitting there listening and you're listening live and you're disagreeing with me or agreeing with me or thinking about anything I'm saying or something I'm not saying, then call in and share your opinion. I'm not, as long as people are respectful, whether you disagree with me or not, I'm not going to, I'm not going to start yelling at people or <laughs> whatever. Um, so please feel free to call in and we will be right back after this. Nonpartisan Liberty for all dot com. You do know is that uh, you know, we have a pattern now of. of And so it was decreed that each year the 12 districts of Pan Am shall offer up in tribute one young man and woman between the ages of 12 and 18 to be trained in the art of survival and to be prepared to fight to the death. This is not the film I expected. I think Gary's movie is far more grounded. I love the sense of reality in the picture. And it's not arch, which I think the material easily could be. Did you read the books? I did. There's a sense that we've still got so much more to come. Um, knowing what's still to happen, how do you how do you in this movie set those things in motion? Oh, that's not my job. That's Gary's job. Uh, and I think he does it brilliantly. He wrote those two extra scenes in the Rose Garden that aren't in the books. Uh, and he wrote them about administering an oligarchy of the privileged. He wrote them about how you control a population that could easily rebel. Mm -hmm. You know, and he, he talked about hope and fear. And uh, and that hope is stronger than fear, and that, but it's a spark. And you can't let it become a flame. You have to contain it. But it isn't contained. And it becomes Katniss Everdeen, who is Joan of Arc, mm -hmm. who's a genius uh, in the battlefield. And he recognizes... Hold on, yeah. for a mo hold on for a moment. Yeah. I think uh, we're seeing, uh, I want to show our viewers these live pictures that we're getting in right now from the scene. Uh, it looks like 
The police are pursuing an individual. Uh, it could be related, might not be related, but uh, let's listen into our affiliate and see what they're saying. This is on a north, south, sorry, east, west street right here. You can see officers with long guns here. In an instant, and that's what we see. And again, a black SUV, uncertain if this is the suspect. You can see tactical teams moving up the sidewalk, looking for positions of advantage right now. Uh, again, the suspect is down. They don't know if additional suspects are in that car. That's where you see those tactical teams moving eastbound. And we're going to come over here, moving eastbound up the sidewalk, trying to find a position of advantage. We're going to come back out. That scene that we showed you earlier, again, that might have been the scene where we have, uh, again, a not confirmed right now, but there is a, sus a possible officer injured that has not been confirmed. We saw several officers standing over that downed person who looked as if they were, were wearing a bulletproof vest down there. But you can see that black SUV, and just to the driver's side on the, so on the north side of that street, there is a suspect down. It looks looks right next to him, looks like to be, I don't want to get too close because that is a gory scene, looks to be like there might be a long rifle down near his feet. Uh, again, I don't want to get too close, but they're trying to get to an, uh, to call out any additional suspects. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go way around the long way. I'm going to go in tight and I'm going to go around the long way so we don't show that suspect down. You can see officers backing off. going to try to get to the car around the long way here. I'm going to double up. You can see here that is a, a dark SUV. You can look at all the bullet holes in the windshield. The left side, driver's side, completely blown out. This was a very, very graphic shootout here. All the windows in this SUV completely shot out. We do not see uh, any additional suspects in there. We saw the tactical teams running back westbound on the sidewalk. You can see they're trying to figure out whether it's clear to approach, trying to find a posi position of cover and concealment right now, which there's not a lot of. Those bushes do not stop bullets. They're trying to find positions of advantage, trying to see if we've got an additional suspect off the right side of the vehicle. They are focusing solely on that vehicle right now. The suspect, they can be pretty assured, is downed off in the middle of the street. He is down, and he is not moving, more than likely deceased. Right now, waiting, calling out to see if there's any additional activity in this vehicle. But all sorts of pandemonium. And I think that original scene, David and Colleen, we showed you, might have been the situation where that original shootout occurred. And unfortunately, it may have been an officer down. Again, not confirmed, just the reports right now that an officer possibly was down in that parking lot. And that's what it kind of looked like. You saw that there was a wreck in the street. You saw all sorts of debris. Two or three vehicles hit. Multiple, multiple officers. Again, unconfirmed confirmed that an officer is hit or this is even something that's uh something that's uh associated with this you do know you do know is that uh, you know, we have a pattern now of, of mass shootings in this country that uh, has no parallel anywhere else in the world and there are some steps we could take not to eliminate every one of these mass shootings uh, but uh, to improve the odds that uh, they don't happen as frequently uh, common sense gun safety laws, uh, stronger background checks, you know, and you know, for those who are concerned about terrorism, uh, you know, some may be aware of the fact that we have uh, a no-fly list where people can't get on planes. But those same people who we don't allow to fly could got, go into a store right now in the United States and buy a firearm, and there's nothing that we can do to stop them. Uh, that's a law that needs to be changed. Uh, and so, uh, you know, my hope is is that um, you know, we're able to contain this particular shooting and, and uh, we don't yet know what the motives uh, of, of the shooters are. Uh, but what we do know is, is that there are steps we can take to make uh, Americans safer uh, and that we should come together in a bipartisan basis at every level of government to, uh, to you know, make these rare. Uh, as opposed to normal. We should never think that uh, this is uh, something that just happens in the ordinary course of events, because it doesn't happen uh, with the same frequency in other countries. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you. Good. You are listening to Nonpartisan Liberty for All Radio with your host, Dave Bourne. Call in at 702-470-7664 or Skype in username Nonpartisan Liberty for All. And thank you, Katie, the voice of Nonpartisan Liberty for All, and also my uh, fiance. But I do think she has a very lovely voice, which is why I asked her to do those. I, I need to do some more because... We don't have a lot, and I end up replaying like the same four over and over again. Uh, I apologize where I 
I ran to the bathroom and I was gone like 30 seconds and I came back and it was playing uh, Donald Sutherland from the Hunger Games. So I I set it up where the order should have went after (laughs) Obama, the standoff clip. So I don't know what the fuck happened there. So I apologize for that. But of course, he distorts the truth and comparing the U S to other countries and saying, well, this doesn't happen in other countries. You can also look at a lot of other things. Supposedly America's supposed to be the freest country in the world. Although I don't believe that it is anymore. Uh, I don't know. I guess it would depend on the state that you're in coupled with what you're looking at specifically, like the from a financial aspect from uh, or the economy or more social freedom or things like that. But I don't think that's, uh, I mean, that's the, uh, what he's using now. I'm sorry about that. I I had to uh, think about it for a sec. What he's using now, because I heard him say that before, is that, well, this doesn't happen in other countries. Well, there's a lot of things that happen in other countries that are bad that don't happen here either where, although they're starting to, unfortunately, but where uh, people are given the death penalty for possession of drugs, uh, that doesn't happen here. Um, Never happened here. Now, I don't know if it's still like that in certain countries in Asia, But it was, if it's not like that now, it was pretty recently. So as far as comparing the U.S. or to other Western countries, which, I mean, there's not that many, just because I was going to call him Barney Frank, but um, (laughs) because he kind of looks like him, but the the other guy who's running for president, the socialist guy, uh, his name, is it Barney? Is that why, um, I did a whole show on him and I can't think of his name. Um, but the, the social Democrat who's running against Hillary, um, he does that as well all the time. He says, well, in, in this country, well, this, I can't, do his accent today um but talks about how in this country and no other country do people have to pay for insurance and people have to pay these medical bills and stuff like that and it didn't used to be like that here i remember ron paul talking about when he was a doctor in like the 60s what the fuck happened between you know, 30, 40 years ago and now. And I'm sure a lot of it has to do with the government because you're going to tell me that back then doctors didn't make a really good salary, that they went through all those years of uh, medical school and they didn't, care about the the salary that they were making uh, and I'm sure they did. So what happened between now and then just like other things like the fact that um well maybe we're getting into like 50 years ago but where only one parent had to work or um, you could own a house on one person's salary or manufacturing was prevalent in the United States. So Bernie Sanders is his name. Sorry, it 
kind of just escaped me. But, you know, Bernie would say, well, it's free every place else, so it should be free here. Well, it's a different country. Not every country allows the amount of freedom of speech that the U.S. is at least supposed to per the Constitution. So I, I think that is an invalid argument to use well in this country this doesn't happen or that doesn't happen i think that's a not a valid argument now if you're pushing for laws to be more universal which obama obviously is with things like the tpp and those other trade agreements that go beyond actual trade way beyond then yeah i guess it would make more sense but i don't know that anyone's saying that well it happens in israel (laughs) so that's one country but i don't know that anybody's saying that it's normal or it should be normal But it doesn't happen to the extent that he wants to say it does. If you look at the murder rate in general and the murder rate by firearms, it has gone down over the past 20 years. And part of the reason, and this doesn't include, if if this was an actual quote-unquote terrorist attack, whether it was real or... ISIS, and I would say if it's a terrorist attack, it's run by the CIA, and that's just my opinion. Why they attacked where they did, uh, I don't have enough information right now to to know any of that. But if it was a terrorist attack, I don't think you could look at it the same way you would look at a shooting that happened out of school or any other type of shooting that happened. And the same way that you make drugs illegal, people find ways to get drugs. It just hires the price and people don't know what they're getting. And the same, but it's the same type of thing, and you can't ban everything, and it's always common sense. This is common sense, and that is common sense. Really, yes, I do believe that ultimately the government wants to confiscate your guns. And how many times has the government, first of all, how many people think they can trust the government anyway? And then on top of that, How many times has the government said one thing? Well, no, we're only going to do this and then never tried to go beyond that. That's what they've been doing since the country started. That's why everything's so fucked up. That's why the Constitution is not followed, obviously, because they said, oh, we're going to do this, but we're only going to go this far and then we're only going to go this far. So. His new things now is compare to other countries. This is a strategy and bring up the no fly list. But leave out the part about the no fly list that you guys just compile that based on. I don't even know what. No one goes to there's no kind of due process or anything like that and you just determine well we're going to put this person on the no fly list but they haven't been convicted of a crime they haven't been charged with a crime we're just saying we're nervous about this person so we're going to put them on the no fly list so it would be the same thing just We don't want this person to have a gun, so we're going to put them on the no-fly list. That's what it would be. There would be no other 
thing they would have to do. Whether you could appeal that or not, one, I guess you wouldn't even know until you went to get a gun. And what you would do at that point, I don't know. I mean, file a case against the federal government and then have it sit there for years until they actually rule on it. And as I had mentioned earlier, I don't know if anybody has ever taken it to court, obviously not because they would, they would have gotten rid of the no fly list, I assume, unless they just used it for that specific person and got them off of it and looked at it that way. Not that the no fly list is unconstitutional or illegal, but that that person being on it, they shouldn't be. So, uh, I don't know if that has happened to this point. You would think it would, but uh, who knows? But that's pretty much my chairs making noises. That's pretty much all I have to say about the, and I guess I said a lot because <laughs> it's already past 8 o'clock, but about what had happened in San Bernardino, but I will be paying attention to that and seeing what their conclusion is. The FBI is already involved and what they had said on Fox News, you already have them calling it their expert or whatever said it's it's an ISIS terrorist attack. Um, the Fox News reporter, this is a quote, said all all Americans are targets, you know, trying to scare people. One woman, I guess, was hiding in a closet that lived in that neighborhood. Well, probably because she can't get a gun. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I understand why she would hide in a closet, but, you know, if you had a gun, you wouldn't have to hide in the closet. But I don't know. That's a whole nother issue there. So I'm going to move on. Um, that was not something, obviously, I planned on talking about. It just happened to happen, to happen today. <laughs> um, so not that it's funny that it happened to happen today, but just that I said it happened to happen sounded funny so so anyway i'm going to get in to the topics that i had planned on talking about tonight uh two forms of media because one's a movie and one's a tv show that really kind of lean or it's debatable and that's really what I want to talk about if they lean towards freedom and are positive when it comes to freedom or if you look deeper they're actually negative when it comes to freedom and are they sending a negative message and for the Hunger Games, it's interesting because I have two articles that kind of say the opposite in a sense. So for people that, that aren't familiar with the Hunger Games, they had four movies. It was based on a book. I didn't read it. I believe my fiance read it actually and it has to do with and there may be spoilers here so just so everybody knows if you haven't seen the last hunger games and you don't want well i'll tell you i guess when the spoiler is for the last one i'm assuming then everybody have seen the other ones although I'm not really going to get into a lot of details that would spoil anything. There's just one part in the final uh, Mockingjay Part 2 
that I'll that I kind of have to mention to make my point that would be a spoiler. So I guess I'll announce that before I get to that point. But what the Hunger Games was about is it's somewhere in the future. I don't believe it says when or even where, but there's all these districts. I think there's 13 districts and then you have the capital. The capital is where I don't think they actually call him the president. Donald Sutherland's character. He rules over all these districts, but I don't believe his title is the president. It's irrelevant, but he's the leader. He might as well be the president. He he might be. I just can't remember if they call him the president or not. But he's the ruler over all this. It it makes it sound like there was a war prior to this and this is how things ended up with all these districts and what they do is I believe it's once a year is they have uh, the hunger they call them the hunger games and what they do is they take a boy and a girl I don't know what the age range is, but they seem to be under 18. So they take a kid, but I don't know what the minimum uh, age is. It seemed to be that they took like kid kids and it's a lottery. Essentially, (laughs) it's a lottery that you don't want to win because you end up in these games where you fight to the death. And I think it, I'm pretty sure it was once a year. Um, The actual games were only in the first two movies, I believe. So in the two Mockingjay movies, there weren't any games going on. So, In the first movie, uh, Katniss, who's played by Jennifer Lawrence, who's the main character, her sister, her younger sister is the one that is essentially the lottery winner. Like uh, she's drafted essentially from that district. So every district, they pull a boy and a girl. And she lives in District 12. All the districts are poor. I think they were eating, (laughs) kind of funny, but I think they were eating beaver. Um, I love to eat beaver personally, but um, I don't know that uh, it's the same type of beaver that they're eating. So they, it seems like the, the life they're living is in poverty and they have to go out and kill animals for food in some of the districts I think it's even worse so they have these hunger games in the winter I guess I'm trying to remember what she got as the winter I mean she got to do a tour of the country I guess, and got a bunch of food and money and things like that. So I, I they get rewarded for winning, but I don't really recall because it was the first and second movie what they get exactly. Uh, but I know they get food, I guess. And that's the, the whole thing being that on one side of it, yeah, it's not a good lottery to win because you could get killed because only one person is allowed to win and you're supposed to kill everybody else. But if you do win, then you get food and I guess money or whatever they use for money uh, at the time. And you get 
to go and be on TV and do these tours and all of this shit. So, so I guess that's a spoiler for the first, if you have never seen any of the Hunger Games movies, but I mean, it's obvious she wins the Hunger Games, but she splits it with the guy from her district. He had some weird name, like, uh, fuck, I can't remember his name. Pippi or something or uh, Peta. <laughs> I, I remember it was it was named after bread. So Peta. So I guess she's there. One of them are supposed to kill each other, but they refuse to, and they allow them to both win. So they they both win in the first one after having to kill people from all the other districts and she's this, you know, star, basically she's on the, it only seemed like there was like one show, but she was on it. It was like a, uh, I'm thinking Phil Donahue, like, uh, but very flamboyant with, um, I can't remember the, I can't remember shit right now. I guess <laughs> I'm like, I can't remember the actor's name. Um, but so they, um, when that they go on this big tour and then in the second one, and I think it's because the way she was acting and how she didn't want to do what they wanted her to do. So it's basically they want to control you after that and make it sound like things are great and be a spokesperson for the capital and the president or whatever he is, the leader. And she kind of disobeyed that to an extent. So what they ended up doing is having a all-star hun- Hunger Games so they took the winners of all the Hunger Games in the second movie and put them all up against each other. And then during that, she, at the end of that movie, uh, at some point she passes out. Um, something happens. I, I can't recall. And she's grabbed by the rebels, which are uh, people that she already knows and her friends and, and whatever. So there's a rebellion against the Capitol. And then in the mocking Jay movies, she becomes the face. She's the mocking Jay. She's the face of the rebellion. So they wanted to go out and find somebody who would represent the rebellion I guess all she does throughout the all the movies is she's representing some some movement one way or the other. So she ends up becoming the mocking jay representing the movement and they're essentially at war with the capital. And then here's my spoiler spoiler alert of course, but I mean this is just obvious anyway. At the end, they throw uh, Donald Sutherland, who's the leader, out of the Capitol and kill him. And that's pretty much uh, the end. Uh, There's one other part that would be a spoiler as well that I'll say before I I, I get to. But um, I, I think that's just pretty obvious that that's where it's going to go that they're going to the good guys are going to win and uh and the other spoiler is that during the movie uh starting in the first Mockingjay part one which would be the third movie hopefully everybody can follow (laughs) along with this but I'm sure a lot of you've seen it anyway but in the third movie, the person who, I guess, nominates her or wants her to be the Mockingjay is Julianne Moore, whose goal is to take over. 
for Donald Sutherland and, and become the president. So she ends up in the end after they kill him. Well, actually, it's before they kill him. Um, well, she announces she's going to be the interim president. And then they'll have elections, but they can't have elections yet. As they are transitioning stuff. And then I think she even mentioned having another Hunger Games. And so Katniss realizes that there's no difference between her and him. You're just, by getting rid of him, you're just replacing him with another version, essentially. So in the end, they kill her too. And then I guess the... Well, I don't know if they actually come out and say it, but they end up having elections, I think, at the end. I think that's how it ends as far as that they have elections for president. So that's, I guess, a long summary of the movie or the movies, and that's kind of why it had to be a long summary because there's four of them. And so there's two articles that I came across and one's titled the hunger Games: should Ron Paul be a hunger Games super fan? Of course, meaning is this a libertarian movie? And this was from 2012 though. And then a, I believe more recent article. Yeah. One from, uh, last week where it talks about it being perfect for millennials. So, and that's from Vox. So in that article, really what they're saying is, okay, if you look at hunger games, you have the elite because surrounding the capital, you had, all the elite, kind of like DC, I guess. Not that all the elite people or all of these uh, billionaires and millionaires live in DC. I don't know why anyone would want to live in DC. I think it's mostly politicians and lobbyists. But all the the elite live in the area around the capital. They don't live in the ghetto districts or whatever they would call them. But the article pretty much goes into it being a movie for millennials because it followed along with what has has happened. And I look at it as more of a socialist type comparison because it talks about the economic crash, then it talks about that uh, millennials, I guess not that they're in poverty, but it's harder for them because of uh, the economic crash, and that Katniss kind of represents the millennial experience how she does that i i don't know i i guess that in the beginning uh she's kind of a pawn of of both sides actually of the new president so i guess they are called president cuz that's what it calls them the rebel leader she's her kind of pawn and then before that Early on in the series, she's the pawn of the current president, but she kind of refuses in both ways to be a pawn of either. And then she really just wants to escape the conflict of what's going on there with the older, what what it talks about is the older generations. 
and that what it says is in the end she really wants to not have to choose a side not to fight um there is an anti-war kind of message in it which i think is positive and that she wants things to be different than what they are so it, it it's comparing it to a, the struggle of a millennial i guess and i i don't know how i would relate it to that but it's because she goes through you know being par- part of living a life i guess of poverty and then going into not a life of poverty when she wins the Hunger Games, but still not wanting to be controlled. And it talks about the millennials being, you know, when they, around the time they finished high school and college and the economy was falling apart, so it was hard for them to get a job. If you look at statistics, a lot of quote unquote millennials are living with their parents and so it's kind of a you know the way this describes it is it's like a a more socialist type story of people need to be equal you have the elites and then you have everybody else and they're being exploited and that the there's no equality and it talks about the battles now let let me read this paragraph here cuz i'm not sure i totally uh understand it and i did read this article but i don't remember everything that was in it It says the push pull between the two sides who want to use Katniss and her escalating struggle to escape both is the central conflict of Mockingjay Part 2. And it's kind of uh, in one as well. And it serves as a stand in for all sorts of tugs of war, the battle between mothers and fathers, between liberals and conservatives, between powerful insiders and the outsiders who threaten them. So... I don't know if it's saying that I don't know. It it says in the end, what Katniss really wants is to not have to choose a side, to not have to fight others battles and play their games. She wants to leave everything behind escaping the endless and unwinnable conflicts and power struggles of the older generation. She wants to build her own life on her own terms. And there was some part that did talk about the uh because it does mention something about it captures the bleakness of the current era and that getting through that but i remember seeing something in the article when i read it about the things not being equal and the issue of the millennials not being in poverty but not being able to I thought it mentioned something about even wages being what they are um, but it does talk about a, a, the recession and then it talks about a post-recession age and what was going on when, uh, I guess when the books hit stores was September 14th, 2008. And that's when Lehman Brothers would file for bankruptcy and everything was going on with the uh, financial uh, collapse and the housing market. And then Obama got elected and uh, took over that January so 
I, I guess I see what they're talking about, but there's it's it, it's kind of weird because a lot of these not just movies but in things that are going on you have groups of people with certain ide- ideologies that agree on certain things like say police so like and I, and I don't want to put labels on people cuz I came up with my uh what am I? I I remember I I named it. I'm uh the born identityist. I'm a born you know cuz it's labels like anarchist and voluntarist and libertarian and stuff like that. I'm a born ident identityist. Which means I can make up my own thing as far as what I am, which stands for promoting the ideas of freedom and liberty and noncompliance and stuff like that. So nobody can get me confused with representing any other uh, form of, I guess, politics or uh, any political uh, party or whatever. So... Because even with, uh, especially with libertarian now, it's just some people take it as one way, some people take it as another. Anarchist is the same way, um, which it really just means um, no rulers, but some people take it as total chaos, and that's not what it means, but whatever. So, uh, sorry, back to my point being that there are people that have, may agree on a certain thing, but it's for one, a different reason. And they have a totally different ideology. So you look at people that are supporting, say, Bernie Sanders right now that are democratic socialists, but that they are part of cop block and fight against the police. And I don't get that because the more laws, the more laws you need to be in, you you need to enforce. If you have a, a, a socialist democracy, you're going to have a lot more laws. You're going to have a lot more taking from people and you're going to have a lot more, force needed or at least things backed by force so you can have people kind of look at things and it still meet some of the ideas that they have within their ideology and also with somebody else so Hunger Games really is what I, I, I'm kind of posing this more as a question, although I know I won't get any answers, is that it, does it actually promote freedom or not? Or is this more of a... Because you can look at it in one of two ways. You can look at it, you have the poor... You have the elite and things should all be equal and they need to take over the capital and throw out the president and get rid of the wannabe, the the one who's going to become interim president because she's going to be the same. She just wants power and control. And I don't know how you would. So what? You're going to go and find somebody else that's not going to be the same way, because to me, you could take that as one, it's going to be a democracy, so everybody's going to vote. Okay, but that doesn't mean you don't end up with the same thing. Or that things are going to be more of a democratic uh, socialist 
set up where everything is equal and that is mandated via the government. But then to me, you still run into the same type of thing. But I took it as when she killed, because it was, uh, this is a spoiler, Katniss was the one who killed, um, I think she killed both of them, but I, I know she killed uh, Julia, Juliana Moore's character that she said, well, one, no, we're not going to have the same thing. But I took it more as almost a no to government that look what we get when we have a ruler. We don't want a ruler. We want to be able to rule our own lives. Now, other people can interpret it differently. So I, after watching the last one, at least, and the ending of it, I think I would interpret it more as a libertarian movie and that agreeing with the other article that uh, says, uh, should Ron Paul be a Hunger Games super fan? But I think in that it, it actually points out the, because this is before the last movie came out. So it does get into anti-war. It does uh, get into, as I said, in my opinion, the saying that we don't want rulers because... And this is where there's there's a big difference, really, between whatever you want to call them. I mean, I guess social Democrats and uh, how I look at things, and I'll just take it from my point of view, not from anybody else's or what they define – how I would define libertarian and anarchist and, and whatever, but that I see how they can see it that way. But really the reason to me for the differences in you have all these people over here that are poor and then you have the elite at the Capitol in the movie. Is that the same thing that's like in Saudi Arabia, where it's because the government, the king, controls all the natural resources, all the oil, and takes all the money for himself? You know, that type of thing. Instead of people having the opportunity to go out and make their own money. So... I kind of look at it that way in the article regarding um, that refers to Ron Paul. It goes through four things, I guess that uh, what does it call the four things? It says we don't think great libertarian poo by Ron Paul would quibble with many of the sentiments sprinkled in Collins writing. Let's run through four of them. So, I'm going to go through these uh, four things. So as long as you can find yourself, you'll never starve. Katniss recalls her father telling her. In this case, the play is, is on her name, a sort of bluish tubber that she claws up from from a riverbank. So she's like a cat. Is that The book begins on this note of ultimate self-reliance that only the individual can keep life alive but that's in the book i don't remember that in the movie to avoid starvation from help with help from the government one was enter a devil's pact and i guess that's the hunger game so i'm not going to read this whole thing but uh number two district 12 where can you starve to death in safety cat 
Katniss laments near the book's outset. It's forbidden for the people of Katniss's district to venture out into the woods to hunt, fish, or gather plants, but they do it anyway. Here one could hear the echoes of the cries of libertarians crying out against the government that by securing total security has all but destroyed liberty. I think meaning that, well, you could take care of yourself, but they won't allow you to because they're telling you you can't go out there. Uh, government bu- Number three, government bureaucrats, a favorite libertarian target, get a very harsh reading. Not only are Pan, Pan and Nem's paper pushers, I don't know what that's supposed to be, uh, aesthetically and culturally bankrupt, the book makes clear they consider themselves far superior to people from the nation's 12 districts. Maybe they're talking about the capital. Yeah, they are. What they do all day, these people in the capital, Kat, Katniss muses, remembering some of her attendants who have dyed their skin pea green or who carry orange corkscrew curls besides decorating their bodies and raiding around for a new shipment of tributes to die for their entertainment. Oh, that's the, I think the, uh, they have like these attendants that help them get ready for the Hunger Games and do their makeup and shit like that. I think Elizabeth Banks, if you saw the movie, was one of those people. And then the fourth one is Lazy Caprices and Warmongering, and it's the last third of those that is most accentured in the Hunger Games. In the modern libertarian movement, the answer to war is to stop policing the world. And then it you know, goes into some other stuff, but yeah. So essentially to stay out of uh, the district is business as well. So I I guess in summary, I would say that I would look at the Hunger Games. I didn't read the books, but the movies at least based on the final movie more as a libertarian or a movie that supports freedom rather than supports socialism because... I think you have these issues that people agree on, but some people's answer is socialism as opposed to freedom. Like corporations, as ex- for example, the corporations that are, you know, taking advantage of people and driving uh, small businesses out of the market but they're being helped by government. So in my opinion, if you got rid of government interference in that and you got rid of all these restrictions that kept the barriers to entry easy to create a new business, then that would be a lot better for everybody and you would have uh, a lot more successful people and you wouldn't have these huge corporations because they wouldn't be getting all these benefits from the government, whether it be tax breaks. Um, Of course, I would get rid of taxes, but you wouldn't have one company paying all this money in taxes when another company is not along with all of the restrictions, excuse me, and all of the um, regulations that actually help the bigger corporations to keep the smaller ones out. Whereas somebody who's a democratic socialist would agree with the problem of corporations, but their answer would be, well, take the money from corporations and tax them more and give them, uh, give more money to uh, people that don't make enough money or force them to increase the minimum wage, which, of course, in either way, one, if you overtax the big corporations, that same money's not going to be there. And people don't realize that. They keep thinking that 
they can take things based on how they are and move them around and they'll be the same. That you can take hundreds of millions from a corporation and they're going to stay in the United States or operate the same and that money's still going to be there. It's not. And that's, I think, a huge flaw in any plan that Bernie Sanders has because he's not going to have that money available. But when it comes to something like minimum wage, it's going to benefit the big corporations because it will cost them more money, but it will give them more a, a bigger market share because it will push out the smaller businesses. So I'm going to take a break. Again, if you'd like to call in, 702-470-7664. That's 702-470-7664. Or you can Skype in username nonpartisan liberty for all. Um, when we come back, I'm gonna talk about this new series on Amazon called The Man in the High Castle. And that is based on the idea that the Nazis won World War II. And they control the U.S. Now, I would say that even if they did win World War II, they would not control the U.S. But for the purposes of this series, they do, which makes it interesting. But is that, does this show promote the ideas of freedom? Is this a show that you can look at and from a positive standpoint, from a freedom and liberty standpoint, that it promotes that? Or is it more of a I don't know what the <laughs> the opposite of it would be, but is it just, you know, entertainment that in a way is is negative because it it could be used as a way to make people feel better about what they have to be to say well at least america's not that and i also want to talk about how the us is now under the us government compared to how it is in the show because i don't think it's that far off anyway but it it could be used as something to show people, oh, look how it could have been, but things aren't aren't that bad. You should be happy that you're not in this situation because you could be, which, again, I don't think you could, but uh, that's the premise of the show. So we're going to talk all about that again, 702-470-7664 or nonpartisan liberty for all, all one word on Skype and we, we will be back after this. where certain events changed is an interesting story, which is why the genre has had success over the years and continues to do so. One of the most famous alternate history novels is The Man in the High Castle by Philip K. Dick, set in an alternate 1962 where the Axis powers won World War II. Not only have they defeated the Allies, but the countries of Nazi Germany, Italy, and Japan took over the entire world. The story tells the perspective of multiple people living in a defeated United States, but they aren't who we care about. What we care about is the scenario. Dick's perspective on this Axis world is dark and disturbing and provides a harsh look at how things could have been had America, Britain, and Russia lost the war. In Dick's world, everything would have changed. Literally everything. So in this video, we are going to explore Dick's scenario and break it down piece by piece to shove into your greedy little mind. The scenario starts off in 1963, when President Roosevelt is assassinated before he ever is able to become a strong president or implement his policies. 
The following presidents, John Garner and later John Bricker, are very weak and destabilize the United States. Without a central leader in the Depression, the U.S. falls into a hole, while Nazi Germany and Japan grow stronger. The U.S. bows to the whim of the Axis powers, staying isolationist and out of European affairs. Since their economy is weak, the Americans are unable to supply the British and Russians in their war against Germany. Quickly, the Nazis are able to conquer both Britain and the USSR by 1941. The Japanese allied with Germany take this opportunity to attack the US in a larger attack against Pearl Harbor. America's Pacific fleet is wiped out in a single day, and soon Japan invades Hawaii. In the next few years, the two powers invade America from both sides, with Japan conquering the west coast and Germany annexing east of the Mississippi. By 1947, all opponents of the Axis powers, including the U.S., surrender. In the following decades, the world becomes much different, as the Axis face relatively no major opposition to their plans. Japan expands its borders to Oceania, Australia, mainland China, and all of Southeast Asia. Japan sets up a white puppet government on the West Coast, called the Pacific States of America. Japan culturally changes the West Coast, making it infused with both American and Eastern cultures. A mass migration of citizens from Japan occurs, changing the demographics of the states. However, even though Japan does control the American West Coast, they are relatively light rulers compared to their Nazi counterparts. Surprisingly, even though they're an empire, Japan has liberalized in the 20 years since the war. As in our timeline, how Americans today prize Native American artifacts, so do the Japanese colonists prize pre-war Americana. In Europe, the story is much darker than in our timeline. In Dick's scenario, the Nazis shape the entire continent and landscape in their image, reshaping the world around them with scientific advancements and horrifying policies. Because of 20 years of German engineering, technology has progressed far beyond the 1960s of our timeline. In Dick's scenario, the Germans have already colonized the moon and set up man exploration of Mars. To gain more land, the Germans drain the Mediterranean Sea, turning it into a fertile farmland. However, these scientific and engineering works come at a terrible price. With nobody to question the Nazi policies, a mega-holocaust occurs after Germany conquers Russia, Poland, and Eastern Europe. Hitler's plan of Lebensraum is actually put into effect. The only comparison this can be is the Native Americans and the Europeans. Slavic people in Dick's scenario are murdered into extinction. Millions and millions of people wiped out in a genocide. Russian culture and Eastern Orthodox religion is non-existent. Poland, Russia, and Slavic lands are destroyed and replaced with German colonists. Hitler's Aryan race grows and replaces the ruins of Moscow and Russia. Any few Slavic survivors live in Native American-style reservations out in Siberia. The Mega Holocaust also expands into Africa, where Nazi Germany in 1962 is leading a genocide against Native Africans. Germany as well brings back African slavery in both Europe and the United States. Which, oh boy, leads us to Nazi-occupied America. After the United States fell, it was reduced to east of the Mississippi, where a Nazi puppet government replaced American democracy, implementing Nazi policies in the U.S. From the context, the Holocaust came to the United States, wiping out anyone deemed unworthy by Nazi standards. What used to be the United States is split into three nations. The Japanese-controlled Pacific States, the Nazi-controlled United States, and the Free States of America. Free States is basically a buffer zone between the two superpowers. Americans don't know life before the war, and those that do are either too brainwashed or find it too hard to imagine a world without Axis domination. Young Americans in Dick's novel accept the status quo and grow up not knowing the culture of pre-war America. They think that an ally victory would have led to a communist victory. Oh yeah, and Canada? Canada just remained Canada. They literally didn't change at all. It's just Canada. Really, Mr. Dick? Get your gun. Yo, yo. No, it's a Samurai Showdown. Samurai Showdown. Samurai Showdown. Nah.
now partisan the liberty for all and we are back so that, that basically described the book because this is based on a book by philip k dick yeah, that's his name philip k dick um good thing that his parents didn't name him Richard as a joke, and then he'd be Dick Dick, or just name him A A Dick. Um, I guess he's P P Dick Philip Dick. Anyway, um, I did find the book at the library, and I have it on hold. The way that. The library works. For those of you who live in Las Vegas, if you have not used the library, you are missing out. We have a great library system. You can get brand new movies, brand new CDs, and of course, brand new books. Uh, every week they have a coming soon page. And I think that's what has come out that week or what's coming out the ne next week. So I would definitely go and get a library card. Of course, it's free. You do get late fees if you don't return things on time, but you can renew it online. And what will happen is it will send you an email when your books are ready to be picked up. So it's pretty cool. Unfortunately, since I started the show, I haven't read a lot, but... I want to make sure I re start reading more so I can talk more intelligently about certain things and that I can go and verify them, which I, I mean, I know a lot of stuff from before I started doing a show. I just I started reading like crazy, like I would just. I wouldn't watch TV at all, and pretty much now I have some cable shows I watch. But other than that, I just watch movies. But he, but I, I was at a point where I thought that it, it was really positive that I was reading, and it was all nonfiction. I was reading a lot of books and getting a lot of information, and and it was, it was a good thing. So. I want to try to mix that in to my schedule along with, of course, working out, um, which I need to do more of as well. But for those of you who stepped away or missed anything in that explanation, and of course, the book is a little different, he actually gave more backstory than they give even in the show but the show it's in its first season 10 episodes it's on amazon prime so if you are an amazon prime member which i think is really worth it because it's 99 dollars a year and you get two-day shipping on almost everything for free um, it has to say prime on it. There's certain items where you don't, but I signed up just because I was getting a lot of stuff from Amazon, like the equipment that I had got. I didn't get it all at once. I had slowly got it. And then most things I order from Amazon. So it's, it's pretty cool. So I'll have even, uh, my fiance, if she orders something, I'll have her order it through my account. And then, you know, she gets the free two-day shipping, and you get things faster, and you don't have to pay shipping for them. So I must have saved way more than $99, and then I got the Amazon uh, Prime movies out of it where you don't get everything, but there's a fair amount of movies, probably just as much as Netflix along with TV shows and 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 things like that uh documentaries whatever and one of them that just came out i believe it came out in the past couple of weeks and i had seen a commercial and i don't even know where i've seen it because i don't really watch much tv and it may have been during a football game and that would be surprising 
one of the things that uh, that actually happened um, was they put up their poster, and in the poster, I guess it had a swastika. sticker. They put it up in a New York subway station, and the governor had them take it down. <laughs> it's fucked up. Uh, who's the governor in New York? Uh, Cuomo. He had them... Is it Cuomo? Because the son of uh, Mario Cuomo. He had them take it down. The fucking retard. So, just because it had a swastika on it. It's a... Obviously, it's a TV show. It's not promoting Nazism. But anyway... And if you look at the event, that was probably the picture. Uh, there's a picture of a Statue of Liberty. I don't know that that was it for a fact, but I'm assuming it was because it does have a uh, swastika there on the picture. It has the Statue of Liberty, and then around the Statue of Liberty, there's like a swastika around her arm and there's one I think someplace else in the picture I'm trying to bring it up right now yeah and then there's one on the uh the building actually you know what I think they changed it because it's not a swastika it is in the oh shit that's probably what happened if you look at the picture that i have is the event photo it's like an eagle like thing and it's on the building and on the statue of liberty uh across her and in the actual show you have a swastika there so maybe they changed it so they could put the pictures up to advertise it Uh, that's funny that's not funny it's kind of fucked up i mean it's it's a it's a tv show anyway it's uh 10 episodes i've seen them all um i had watched it over you know i had a couple days off over thanksgiving and i thought it was a pretty good show now i First, the first thing that came up was, of course, that I don't think that would happen because even if the Allies had lost World War II, I don't think they'd ever get to the United States. And if they did, you'd have people in the United States that would fight back. Now, you could say that. Well, and this is the premise that they got the bomb before the U.S. And that was the whole, uh, I think, premise of the show. And they bombed Washington, D.C. And after that, oh, and they assassinated Roosevelt. And the presidents after him weren't as strong uh, presidents. And they don't say that in the show, though. They said that in the clip that I played. So I guess it says that in the book. And I'm not a fan. Roosevelt hated Jews almost as much as fucking Hitler did. Um, I didn't find that out till the last couple of years. But he wrote some some fucked up things. So I don't know that not having him as president would have done much to change things i think the premise that they're basing it off of is that without the new deal the u.s would have never came out of the depression so they they assassinated him and the u.s didn't have a lot of money so they weren't able to support any of the other countries And, and i think it was based on the book, based on what he was saying in the in the clip, that they didn't get involved and they also didn't give any money. 
And because at the end of World War II, and we've talked about this, and this is why the dollar became the reserve currency, was because everybody owed the U.S. money. And they had all the gold. And Europe was decimated. But I guess if it's based on the premise that they didn't get out of the Depression, but I don't think you can say that because of the New Deal that may may have made things worse in the first place. Now, of course, the Federal Reserve was already had already existed at that time. So had income tax. So, and it's funny how, of course, the Federal Reserve one of their jobs was to make sure that you didn't have uh, those crashes like that. And of course what 10 years later you have a huge crash but that that's their premise so whatever so the show takes place in 62 so a lot of the people have just grown up under the nazi territory or under the japanese territory and they mentioned italy in that clip but italy is not mentioned at all in the show, at least in the first season. So it's Japan controls the West Coast, the Nazis control the East, and in between is the lawless zone or the neutral zone, but they call it like the lawless zone, where I would definitely be there um, then be under occupation from some other, uh, you know, Nazi or Japan. And it's kind of different even in how they govern. And, and I don't know if they mentioned it in that clip or I, there's another clip I have where on the German side, it's all Americans running things in the U S so the uh, most of the people in the U S that are in power are Americans that joined up with the Nazis and on the Japan side, the Japanese run everything. And as far as being Jewish, Although there are some, and I don't want to spoil anything, so I won't get into specifics, but although there, uh, Jews are allowed to live in the Nazi area and they don't go after them, they will use it against you if they have to. So if they're trying to get something out of you, but they torture people, they, you know, do all the same uh, shit, they're ruthless dictators, basically, just like they were in uh, reality. So, in watching the show, you know, one, it's just, it's hard to kind of comprehend, but not comprehend the show, but you look at it and you see the U S and the Nazis controlling, you know, a half of the country and the Japanese controlling the other half of the country. And so I guess they dropped bombs on Washington DC and maybe someplace else and they surrendered and then they, they took everything over. So, But what I really wanted to talk about and look at regarding the show is, one, I've talked about his book before. Jim Mars wrote a book, The Rise of the Fourth Reich. So Hitler's regime was called the Third Reich. And I don't know why it was called the Third Reich. And maybe that's an easy thing that most people know, and I'm stupid, but 
Uh, I don't know why it was called the Third Reich. But anyway, so what his premise is, is that National Socialism, which is really what Nazis stood for, was never defeated. They just defeated Hitler and his regime, who were the ones that were executing it at the time. But actual Nazism or National Socialism was never defeated. It was imported to many places, including the United States, and it was imported literally into the United States Operation Paperclip, which is declassified, which talks about all of the Nazi scientists and doctors and other positions that were imported into the United States, either given new identities and new uh, passports or however they did it, but or just brought in as somebody who wasn't part of the Nazi regime, was just somebody who happened to live in Germany and was living under the uh, Nazi regime and couldn't do anything about it. I mean, what do you do in that situation? Now, I know what I would do, but of course we all probably say the same thing that, yeah, if I was in that situation, I'd be shooting them motherfuckers and whatever. But we can easily say that, but to do it is a whole nother thing. And we've talked about false flags before, and that's one of the things that actually happened during Hitler's takeover. Remember Hitler was elected. They had a Congress, you know, people don't think about these things. And then I forget what it was, what building, maybe it was the Congress building, but caught on fire and burnt down or something. And then they blamed it on Poland and said that they did it when actually Hitler did it to blame it on Poland. It's the the simplest fucking trick in the book where you do something and blame it on somebody else. I mean, people do it all the time, probably in their personal life. I personally have never done that because I'm too honest of a person and I wouldn't do that anyway. But countries, uh, especially politicians, are some evil motherfuckers. If you take, I think in general... Although, at times I may doubt this, but in general that most people are good. I know that most people are good at least that, you know, they wouldn't just kill somebody or do stuff like that. Do stuff to hurt other people, the majority of of people. But you have that small percentage. And I think out of that small percentage the percentage that doesn't actually go out and commit crime go into Wall Street or go into politics. But anyway, so at the time of the show, Hitler is old because it's 62 and he's dying he has Parkinson's. They say uh, someone made a statement that you could see him shaking and that he only had like six months or something. But I don't know that that's the case. But there was a plot to kill him within the show because they want to attack Japan. So Germany if Hitler goes, will attack Japan and take over all of the U.S. Hitler, however, wants to keep peace with Japan, who would be wiped out by Germany if they were to go to war, at least in the show. That's the premise there. So... You have a resistance 
And this is where the show kind of takes on something really interesting. There's this man in the high castle. You don't see him. You don't. They just talk about him where there's these films and they're films of what could be not the reality. And you don't know where that's going to go, which makes it interesting as well. So it's not just the fact that to see, okay, how things are, but also these videos that Hitler likes and he's trying to get them. So that that's kind of the main premise, I think, for the first season is Hitler's trying to get all these films from the man in the high castle. And the man in the high castle is trying to get all the films as well from the quote unquote rebels. So the Nazis send out their people to go and try to get the films and get them to Hitler. And that that's, I guess, the main plot in the first season. I guess they had said that the book was pretty short, so they're trying to stretch it out and make it into a series that at least lasts a couple years. And, of course, with the series, I mean, they can go probably wherever they want to go with it. I mean, they can take it you know, follow the book and then keep going with it. And hopefully they will. But the other thing, so I'm I'm looking at this from two perspectives, just like when I was talking about the Hunger Games. So you can look at it and say, well, look at how things could have been. And... People in the U.S. have freedom. I'm not saying that they do, but I'm saying this is what the pitch would be or the, well, whatever you want to call it. I don't know that I call it a pitch, but the other side would be that, well, we have freedom. Look what would have happened. And it supports war from this side. I'm not saying the show supports war. It actually, you have a lot of people that are out for peace within the show between, but that's between Japan and Germany. And it's kind of fucked up because you have the peace between Japan and Germany that certain people want to maintain. But while they're keeping that peace, they're treating the people, the natives that they're occupying uh, like shit where... If they want to, they'll just grab them off the street. They'll kill them if they want to. Uh, They'll do whatever. So you have that as well, that it's totally set up where there's, there's no freedom if you're not part of, on the Nazi side, if you're not a Nazi. Or even if you are and you fuck up, you could get killed. If you're on the Japanese side, they can pretty much do whatever they want, and they will. So I don't know which side is better. And on the Japanese side, um, I'm not sure if I had mentioned this earlier. I may have that the... Japanese are all yeah I did that the the there are no Americans that are in positions of power on the Japanese side it's all Japanese on the Nazi side there are so I guess there could be people that grew up there but probably they would still be the sons and daughters of native Japanese that came from Japan. So without getting into too much detail, uh, as I don't want to ruin anything, there's uh, the Ministry of Defense who seems to be a good guy and wants peace between the Nazis and the Japanese 
and doesn't agree with some of the things the Nazis do. But of course, he's part of the J- the Japanese regime who uh, goes along with them killing people if they don't answer their questions and they torture them and they uh, do things like that. Now, it all had to do with the films, all the torture and killing uh, that they showed on the Japanese side. So I don't know if it's a regular thing. I guess we'll have to see next season. But that's what it seems like, that they don't have a system of, well, I would still call it a system of injustice here. But they don't have a system of justice where you get a trial, you get any of that. They just determine your, they torture you. And they determine whether you're guilty or not, I guess. And if they don't think you're guilty, they after they torture you, eh, they let you go. But that's only based on a couple of scenarios of things related to the films. So I don't know whether it's worse to be... I I would say it's probably worse to be under the Nazis, but it depends. Because if you're Jewish, I believe they'll still kill you. But you, if you're Jewish, you can live in the Japanese section, or you can live in the neutral zone. But if you're Jewish or have any Jewish blood, and I, I think I was talking about this yesterday whether it's a race or a religion, but to them, it doesn't matter if you have, you know, as I had mentioned, my father was Jewish. So his whole family, that side of the family is, so I would be considered having Jewish blood. And if I was on the East Coast, they would kill me. So compared to be com- uh, comparing to be under the Japanese. The other thing, though, that was a positive, I think, was that they didn't allow guns. So you look at that as well, that I think it sends a good message that the penalty for having a gun I don't know if it's death, but it's illegal for people to own guns. So, and that's under the, it's probably under the Nazis as well, unless you're one of them. But under the Japanese section, it's illegal to own guns. So there, there's that part of it as well. But really what my main question is, uh, Oh, sorry. Let me go back to before I ask that. So you have the one side where you can look at it like things could be like this. You should appreciate what you have. And like I said on Thanksgiving, if anybody listened to that show, I talked about how you should appreciate what you have. But just because you have a lot of positive things or there's a lot of positive things in your life and you have this or that, that doesn't mean that you can't complain or do something about the negative things. Meaning, and in my case, like I can sit there and say, Hey, I'm appreciative and thankful for my fiance, uh, for my mother, for my job, uh, a place to live, you know, things like that. But that doesn't mean because I appreciate that I can't criticize the government and talk about all the things that they're doing to take away uh, people's freedoms. And that because I do that, I don't appreciate the things that I do have. 
that would be like if you have that mentality that that would be like not having any drive to do anything because you would be saying oh i appreciate what i have i shouldn't want more because there's nothing wrong with wanting more there's i think something wrong with if you're say too materialistic or too that kind of wanting more but to want to make more money or want to have more or want to have a bigger house. I mean, even that, there's nothing wrong with any of that or wanting to have a nicer car. I'm just saying there's some people who take it to excess and don't appreciate shit. But so there's that side of it. And I don't think it will be taken that way. However, when I was listening to some of the interviews, that's kind of what they were saying, like almost like, oh, you know, it makes people appreciate the freedom that they do have. And I'm like, well, I don't know about all that. And the I don't know if he was the writer or the director or what uh, role he played in the series. I mean, he wasn't an actor. He was, you know, maybe he was the producer, but he was uh, behind the scenes, one of the main people. And it sounded like he looked at it as related it to some of the things that were going on today. So the other way to look at it I think is from the standpoint of what is the U S currently compared to what it is in the show. Now I would say right away that it's not as bad as it is in the show because the things that are going on, Although some of the things that are going on are happening to some people, but it's a lot more rare. But how far is it from where we're at now? So if you look at it, and this is where I bring in Jim Mars's book, and I, I really suggest you read it, The Rise of the Fourth Reich. And there's a lot of facts about what happened in Germany as well and how Hitler kind of took over there. Because, again, Hitler was elected. The other thing that people tend to not know or not realize or not think about is, how do you think that Germany, who was just in World War I and lost and must have spent a lot of money, was able to, what, World War I, I think, ended in, what, 1918 or 1919? And then you have 20 years later, not even, well, about 20 years later, he's starting another war. That's not that long. How do you think they got all that money to fund everything they were doing. Well, they got it mostly from people in the U S the grandpa Bush was one of them. I always bring him up cause I always remember him. David Rockefeller was over there before the war. Now he says, well, I was doing whatever, like some studying abroad shit. But it's almost like you had a test of how this would work. I mean, I there, there's so many different possibilities, I guess, of what they were trying to do. But, you know, you did have, like, the Rothschilds, 
who I think were the originators of this, or it might have went on before them because this is like the 1800s, who would pit one enemy or one country against another and finance both of them. So they collect money on the interest. So they, and not only that, is in lending the money, they would also get a say or at least some kind of relationship where it affected the government or they were friends with the government or they were able to control certain things. Just like the World Bank was going to lend money to the Ukraine. But they were only going to lend money based on specific circumstances, and it had to do with uh, financial things. Like, they had to do all of these things financially for them to lend the money. And I don't know if they ever lend them the money or not. I kind of stopped following what was going on in the Ukraine, which maybe I shouldn't have, but it's hard to follow everything that's going on. And we'll see, I guess, what happens there. But the U.S. did give them money. But there's usually some kind of, when you're getting money from at least a country, or a world bank, if you're just borrowing money from a regular bank, usually it's just the interest. But what they would do, and this is something that Rockefeller, David Rockefeller, did at Chase Bank, was he was the VP of this, is he would invest in all of these countries. So, like, South America, I think, was one of the continents that they hadn't really done a lot with, And he went over there and tried to lend money to them. And I think he did. And, of course, you have under certain circumstances and building relationships with the government where he got to meet. You have a fucking banker, really, and, you know, millionaire or whatever, getting to meet with the heads of countries, governments. And even if it wasn't something where they had to do something to get the money, it still allowed him access to these people. So that's what the, you know, a lot of these uh, millionaires and billionaires, I'm sure, did. And and I just know reading, I think it was... uh, the other book that I said everybody should get, The Creature from Jekyll Island, where it talked about the Rothschilds and them. Uh, basically, it's like betting both sides or giving money to both parties, hedging your bets. And that's what, what they would do. And they they made money off it, and they also got uh, built relationships and were able to probably control certain things as well. And that led to, of course, not directly, um, I'm not saying there's any relationship, but like the CIA going into countries and installing leaders. I'm not saying that one has anything to do with the other, but just the idea of going into other countries and possibly saying, oh, well, we'll help to rebuild your infrastructure or we'll do this or we'll do that. We're going to, you know, if we install this leader, uh, or if we get you elected or whatever. So I I think things like that have been going on for a long time. So all of these 
American companies, and of course this was prior to the war, but Hitler could have never did anything without the funding. And from what I understand, most of that funding came from U.S. companies. And they're the ones who built him up. Now, the reason why was it just the companies trying to make money? I'm sure you had some companies because before he had uh, gone to war when he had first taken over and they were doing business with him, were some of these companies companies that were just doing business outside the U S maybe. <laughs> um, but it, from what I understand, I mean, they were doing business with him even during, you know, secretively even later and they supported him. So why would they do that? Now, there's obviously, I believe, an agenda there, and that may have been, let's see, you know, to them, it's all a fucking game, and they're sitting in the U.S., not really worried about it, but, yeah, I mean, to them, it's just, it's a fucking game. It's all games to them. When you're a billionaire, or uh, maybe back then, multimillionaire would, you know, but billionaire by today's standards, they get pr- probably get bored and even did things just for entertainment. But I'm not saying they were doing this for entertainment. I'm saying that they want control. That even now, they want to be able to control things to say, I think the world should be like this. And you know what? I have enough money to actually influence that. So I don't know if, and I can't recall from the book what Jim Mars's theory was there because it's been a couple years since I read the book. But it it seemed like it was you know maybe even a okay an experiment and let's see how this plays out you know here and then maybe by the end even they thought okay well he's fucking it up he's not doing it the way it should be done so we need to you know get him out of there anyway um and maybe they stopped uh, funding him as well. But what they didn't defeat, and this is Jim Mars's theory, is that, yes, they defeated Hitler and the German army, but they never defeated National Socialism. National Socialism continued to exist. And it was literally, as I said earlier, it wasn't just brought over to the United States as a theory or a in laws or in that sense. It was literally brought over. Now, I know the rationale behind it was, okay, we have to, well, you know, this was all after the war because I'm thinking, you know, of the uh, atomic bomb. But they felt supposedly that they had all this advanced technology, which I believe they did. Uh, They had all these scientists working on whatever they had. So, I mean, I don't know what the number was. Um, I should look that up. But 
from what I understand, I mean, it wasn't like it was, you know, 10 people. I mean, there's people that they still, uh, I had mentioned there was somebody in my neighborhood that was a former Nazi. Now, I don't know if he was one that they had brought over or he just happened to somehow, you know, of course, back then, it's not like it is now. Um, it was much easier probably to, not probably, of course, uh, fake IDs and things of forging papers and things like that. But why would they need, you know, even with the positives, I guess you could say, with the... Um, you know, what they got out of it. And a lot of what they got had to do with the military. It was military technology, but even doctors and all of these other areas as well. Hopefully you can't hear the dog barking because the dog is barking loud, but I know that in the past there's been noise that I have heard that didn't actually come through because I do have the room somewhat soundproofed. That's why I was mad when I was going to move and I'm like, I fucking paid all this money to soundproof the fucking room and then I have to move. But a lot of them were scientists that were working on different things. And so according to Wikipedia, rocketry, aeronautics, medication, or not medication, medicine, but also biological weapons, chemical weapons. I mean, a lot I know was, um, was for the military, intelligence, electronics. And I don't know, it doesn't say here how many, but from what I had thought, it was in the thousands that they brought over that many. I guess in 1945... The rock they brought over 127 just rocket scientists. And that's where I see when I talk about things like generally accepted practices and generally accepted knowledge in things like medicine. Medicine just meaning like doctors, like that there are things that are just generally accepted among doctors, whether they're actually true or not, like that vaccines most, and I'm not going to say, I guess, every single one because there's been some new vaccines, but that the uh, vaccines are... uh, I hope I you know you probably can't hear that what the fuck um that you know the vaccines are all good for you and whatever and the reason why I doubt a lot of the stuff and of course you know looking at all this other information that's one of the reasons but um Doctors, one of the reasons I doubt it was because a lot of these doctors are just told that this is safe, this is fine, and you don't have to worry about it. And they never tested it themselves or never did anything uh, themselves. They just... 
essentially uh, were told that. So they're they're taught in say medical school that. And I'm just using vaccines as an example that this vaccine works this way and does this. And, you know, we've had these tests on it and it's fine. But that's just what they're being told. I got to take a quick break because I have to shut this fucking dog up. Um, Not that I'm going to hurt the dog to shut it up. I just uh, probably put a. Um, put them outside or something or see what's going on. So I'm going to take a quick break. I'll probably go to 10, 10.30 tonight. I can't go any later than that because I need sleep. Luckily, I got a nap, though, so that did help. But I definitely need to get to sleep uh, by a certain time tonight so I won't be tired in at work today like I was yesterday. So we'll be right back after this. Nonpartisan Liberty for all dot com. Welcome back to Baseline Beatnik. I am Brandy, and now I'm going to be watching The Man in the High Castle. I didn't do any research as to what this is, but it is a Comic-Con trailer, so that should be super interesting. I'm excited to be watching it, and I'm glad you're watching it with me. Let's check it out. Oh, Amazon Prime. If you could do anything with your life, what would you like to do? My father told me what it was like before the war. He said every man was free. I want my country back. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the Axis powers of America. Because I want to do the right thing. Take this. What is this? A way out. Hmm. Wow. That looks very, very interesting. That's awesome. I mean, that would be a terrible place to live because I believe in equality and I don't believe in mass genocide like Hitler and all of his little crazy minions, but it would be interesting to watch what Ridley Scott's take on a life like that and how it would be and how your interactions would change, and what your liberties are, and what the world actually is. He has quite an imagination. I mean, coming from the director of Aliens and Prometheus and all of those awesome films, I, I love sci-fi. And the, although this, I don't think, qualifies as sci-fi, it might have a sci-fi element to it, which would be also pretty cool. It also debuted at Comic-Con, which makes me think that it might, in fact, have some sort of scientific element or sci-fi element to it. And that actually sounds like just what's needed in this country to get the youth to start a revolution. And with that being said, of course that's why the Obama administration is encouraging his youth brigade to get out there and propagandize to the youth. And a young liberal group is doing just that. Think again. Pattis' father was killed in a mining accident. If he had union protection, that never would have happened. 
In the wake of her husband's death, Katniss's mom had no access to therapy and fell into a deep depression, which cost her her job, causing the family to starve because the capital provides no food stamps. Like it or not, the Hunger Games are real. President Snow's 1% wants to cut life-saving programs while using their glamour to distract us. The Harry Potter Alliance is a group that's trying to push a progressive agenda by politicizing Hunger Games fans. Now, the campaign aims to inspire the youth to get off their phones and start a revolution by tackling issues of the 12 districts, such as health care access, homelessness, voting access, unemployment, and food security. That sounds legit, but the, the drive says that they're really trying to push the main theme of the hum, Hunger Games, which is income inequality. Hmm, where have I heard that before? But this increasing inequality is most pronounced in our country. And the idea that so many children are born into poverty in the wealthiest nation on earth is heartbreaking enough. But the idea that a child may never be able to escape that poverty because she lacks a decent education or health care or a community that views her future as their own, that should offend all of us. And it should compel us to action. We are a better country than this. Now, conservative fans of the books and films are saying that the Alliance is willfully ignoring the real antagonist of that movie, which is the totalitarian government. They say by pushing Obama's message on income equality, they're, they're missing the, the danger there, the real warning of having an Orwellian government that controls the food stamps and the access to health care and applies pressure on them via the good guy unions. So... They're basically trying to get the youth to demand more government, more control. <laughs> so, of course, that is all part of the New World Order master plan to dupe you into demanding more government control in the name of humanitarianism. So I am going to read a little excerpt from what could have uh, inspired the Hunger Games. I know Alex Jones says this is what helped crystallize his awakening. None dare call it a conspiracy by Gary Allen. We do sell this at the InfoWars store. It says, what we are witnessing is the communist tactic of pressure from above and pressure from below. The American middle class is being squeezed to death by a vice. The, we do see these young groups in the streets trying to be revolutionary groups, and virtually all members of these groups sincerely believe that they are fighting the establishment. In reality, they are an indispensable ally of the establishment in fastening socialism on all of us. The naive radicals think that under socialism, the people will run everything. Actually, it will be a clique of insiders in total control, consolidating and controlling all wealth. So there you can see that lovely diagram of the vice there. We've got the... Rothschilds, the Rockefellers, pressuring the middle class and the unions and youth groups there are pressuring from below. So that's the trick. Don't be duped into that. All these youth groups are part of this effort, and they're, they're totally helping the very establishment that they are trying to stop. But if you really want to stop income equality, you have to go to the root of the problem, and that's that our presidents keep shipping all of our jobs overseas with these trade agreements like NAFTA and the TPP that our beloved dictator is now trying to fast track. And if people don't cut this off before it gets even worse, I am afraid that those people that are out there fighting for income equality and to raise the minimum wage are just going to continue to find themselves in a Walmart economy. Excuse me, sir. What brings you out here today? I come here uh, with the Workers' Defense Project in solidarity with the 5 for 15 campaign. Do you think it may be more effective to maybe have these type of protests at the Federal Reserve? Uh, not instead, but in addition to this, I agree. Shikari, ask him if he knows anything about the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Sir, have you ever heard of the Trans-Pacific Partnership? Yes. Okay, can you okay. tell me a little bit about it? Yeah, as uh, someone uh, from, I'm from Mexico, and seeing how the NAFTA devastated our country, I just am really terrified of, about how it's trans-Pacific. Trans Glad you brought up NAFTA, because a lot of people don't know about this NAFTA thing, the NAFTA superhighway. GMOs, do you think GMOs is maybe affecting things? Yeah, in a big way, in a big way. 
I, I personally, I'm not a scientist. So I didn't study it, but I've done a little research on the web and looked some stuff up, and apparently they're very bad for you. Some very educated people are uh, happy to see, you know, guys know about GMO, guys who know about the NAFTA superhighway and things such as that. These aren't just people looking for more money. You know, they're interested in things like the Federal Reserve. They're interested in things like healthier food. So hopefully, you know, these guys can get a raise, but also hopefully we can get these guys outside of a, a Federal Reserve building. And if you need any more... Pr- school and threatened with expulsion for firing a male you are listening to nonpartisan liberty for all radio with your host dave bourne and we are back here on nonpartisan liberty for all uh <clears throat> i had unfortunately just looked at the amount of listeners to the live show and that was very sad um <laughs> there are people listening but i get more listens usually in the archives but uh it's just very low today um i don't know i know there's uh some people that for whatever reason well i know why but i don't think it's anything that i did wrong but do not uh or i guess maybe have a issue with me and maybe they voiced that issue and said you know whatever uh, and bad mouth the show or something i don't know because it seems since then that the listens have gone down so that's cool though i i think i know what uh i think i know the the reasons why and what people are doing or not doing since then and yeah it's people in las vegas just so i didn't want anybody in new hampshire to think that it has anything to do with them but uh i noticed uh some people in las vegas that would even possibly also share uh the show at times that they aren't doing that anymore but that's cool. I, I I will remember that, and no matter what, I will continue to bring you the best show possible. <laughs> no, um, but anyway, uh, back to the man in the castle tower, and that's what I was talking about where. And sorry, I kind of skipped there at the end. I just meant to play that one little segment. The whole income equality thing and them using Hunger Games as a way to promote that. So that's where you kind of have this almost in... I guess what you'd call the libertarian party or people that are kind of libertarians or maybe they call themselves libertarians, but they're really not. Or, I mean, you, you definitely have a lot of that, but where you can take these things and look at it different ways where you can take something like hunger games and look at it in a totally different way and try to present it in a totally different way than the way I would look at it. Or at least the last uh, episode, how I looked at that. But you also have, I think, a lot of differences within movements so before I, I guess I get back to the man in the uh, high castle, say for example, the the easiest way to to really show to show it 
is when it comes to cop block. Because you have cop blocks all over the country. And Pete and Ademo, who are the founders, Pete Ayer and Ademo, I don't know what he goes by, Freeman, but I think his real name is Adam Mueller. But, um, and I had Pete on the show, and that's when I, I had the most listens ever. That, that's how popular Pete is, just having Pete on the show. I think I had something like 700 or 800 listens. If I count the replays that I did of when he was on the show, it was just a ridiculous amount of uh, listens. And I had hoped that would turn into uh, something, but unfortunately, it did. Things did go up for a while. Um, I think at one point for a few weeks there, I was doing at least a hundred. Uh, I had a hundred listens a night, and that lasted uh, for a few weeks. And then I had actually went away for a week for work, and I was off. And then I came back and went back down. But um, my point being is that within even cop block. Even though the founders have uh, that uh, that viewpoint where they would call themselves probably voluntarists or I think that's what Pete even um, when we had talked about it when he was on the show and I said I I don't like labels and I think he said the same thing uh, and that if he had to call himself something, it would be a voluntarist. But that doesn't carry over to everybody else, I guess, in the cop block. A lot of these, and, and I mean, that's fine in the sense that I I guess it's better to have a cop block office or a cop block in your uh not office uh, a cop block group in your city than to have nothing at all but I think it really changes things because it changes I think what your goals are so you have People that uh, who also call themselves libertarians that were part of uh, cop block and actually writing for the three free thought uh, project that support Bernie Sanders for president. And if you want to support Bernie Sanders, that's fine. That's your prerogative. But you don't believe in true freedom and liberty if you support Bernie Sanders. So I want to, in general, try to be more open and more understanding to people because my goal is to get these ideas out there. Of course, with uh, the amount of listeners I have at (laughs) right this moment... Or even for the night, I don't know that um, the people that uh, had listened, it might have just not updated, but <laughs> the that the people it's showing that are they're, they're still even listening at the moment. But um, sorry, getting back to Bernie Sanders. I want to be more open to people as far as them, you know, trying to communicate these ideas to even people that support people like Bernie Sanders. But I need to also make it clear that if you support Bernie Sanders, you shouldn't uh, be walking around calling yourself a libertarian or 
anything like that, really, you're probably a democratic socialist. <laughs> I mean, to be honest. And that's where that there's that huge difference where you have these issues and people might agree on the issue and even partially what to do on the issue. But at the same time, they have totally different ideologies. And that doesn't mean that you can't work with uh, people on a issue that you agree on, but where you have, say, in general, have different ideologies. It's just like a Democrat and a Republican. Well, to me, they're pretty much the same anyway. But whatever, we'll say they're not. And them working together on an issue that they agree on even though they don't agree on a bunch of other issues. But I think you have these people, a certain amount of them, and I've seen it in what they've posted, like these members of Cop Block that I used to be Facebook friends with. And before, what I did was just un unfriend people, and I don't do that anymore. I I pretty much won't unfriend anybody unless they, you know, do something really bad, like, you know, start insulting me or something. I don't know. But I won't just unfriend somebody because of what their views are. But I was before. I'm like, well, I don't want to have somebody that's talking about uh, that's part of cop lock and then talking about white privilege and all of that stuff and and constantly talking about it in their posts even though they're part of cop block so there were a few people there and i'm thinking of um one in particular uh that other Somebody else who has a show actually mentions them all the time. Um, they they may be, like, obsessed with them or something. But that's why I'm thinking of it, because I heard them uh, say that. And it, and it is actually true um, with that person. But that's where it's... It's kind of hard to explain, but it's like you have people that consider themselves libertarians or people that consider themselves people that believe in freedom and liberty. And I'm not talking about the conservatives that talk about freedom and liberty that are just full of shit. I'm talking about people that are really progressives or Democrats or socialists that somehow think that they're libertarians because they support cop block or something like that. And these issues are not libertarian issues a lot of them like income equality is not a libertarian issue uh, the libertarian side of that the true libertarian side of that would be the government should totally stay out of business meaning that sounded kind of weird how i uh, said that but th that the government should stay out of a business's business or uh, shouldn't be regulating businesses and what they can and cannot do. But you have people that seem to 
associate with libertarians and seem to call themselves um, even anarchists. And that's why I, I don't want to use the word anarchist, not just because of the fact that people totally uh, have a opinion of it that's totally wrong and thinks it means total chaos and things like that. But the majority of people that call themselves anarchists are more uh, leftists, I guess. And not to say that I wouldn't call myself a, a I was going to say a rightist <laughs> because you got leftists and rightists, right? But I wouldn't call myself a conservative or even close to it. But I'm definitely not a leftist or progressive in any way. And even though I agree with them on some issues, it's for totally different reasons. And it's, you know, as I've said, I believe in true freedom and liberty. And to sum it up would be you can do whatever you want as long as you don't directly hurt anybody or their property. That's how I would best sum it up. And that includes, you know, trying to take money from people and distribute it to other people or anything the government does or government programs or any of that. So even though, yes, I'm compassionate or I feel bad for certain people in the situations that they're in, I think if there wasn't a government or at least there wasn't these programs that there would be enough people that would actually help because there are plenty of people that help now with the government taking the amount they do in taxes and then people knowing that the government helps people. So part uh, part of it is that people know anyway, like, oh, well, they can just get government assistance. And if that didn't exist, I think there'd be a lot more charity. And I think it would be even better because, of course, the government is bad at everything they do. So I think from a charitable standpoint that if the government had nothing to do with it, that people would be in the long term better off. I, I think it might take a little while for people to kind of adjust to that and not being used to the government not helping people and having to do it through charity. Or you do stuff through also insurance, like unemployment. You would get unemployment insurance. So if you get laid off, you get paid. And you could probably do it where you get a higher fucking percentage than what the government gives you anyway. They max out at like $400 a week, which is nothing. Anyway, I got totally off topic there. Sorry about that. So, uh, regarding the man in in the high castle, and I'll try to do this uh, quick. So, my point is really, how far are we from where they're at in the show? And even for those who haven't seen the show based on my explanation of the show, I think almost everything that goes on in the show goes on in society. It just doesn't happen as often or as a, it's, it's not 
technically legal in many circumstances for the government to do certain things, but we all know the government can do whatever they want. So I think part of the difference is in the show, it's legal for them to do it and they'll do whatever they want and they can do it and and can do it from a legal standpoint but with the US government where they have essentially imported the same thing anyway Technically, it's not legal for them to do a lot of these things, but they'll do it anyway. The cops will fucking torture people. Um, The CIA, of course, we know they torture people. Uh, The FBI. So law enforcement tortures people. We know that the government has people killed. That's and these are things that are technically not always. Well, in certain circumstances, they are legal anyway. So, I mean, you have that going on. You have uh, reporters that were killed that I believe that were killed by the U.S. government. You have political prisoners like Bradley Manning and, uh, or sorry, Chelsea Manning and Snowden, if they ever caught him, or people that are arrested for uh, things like any crime that's considered a crime against the state, any drug crime. As far as I'm concerned, anybody that's in jail for drugs, that's a political prisoner as well. So it's not that far off. If you watch the show, now I know people that haven't been exposed to a lot of things and maybe don't know about a lot of things that have gone on. I mean, cops can kill people legally. Look at the Nevada, the Nevada statute. Basically a cop can kill somebody pretty much for, uh, all these reasons. So the, there's, there's pretty much not a, a reason that they can't kill somebody. I mean, there is, but there's not like, there's enough in there to say I was uh, scared. So I shot and killed him or whatever. So they can pretty much get away with it legally. So it, it's not even the, they get away with it because of the, just the system. That's part of it, but it's also because it's legal as well. So, you have all these things that are going on in this show that maybe they're not going on to the extent or to the, as far as, as often as they are, you know, where you don't have the, the government murdering somebody every day. Well, no, that's not true because you have the police killing somebody, um, multiple times a day. So, but I think some of the instances are self-defense. I I don't think every single time a police officer kills somebody that it's not in self-defense, but it's hard to know when it is and when it's not because they lie. So, and they'll say, a lot of the times like, Oh, well, you know, he had a knife. He was coming at me with a knife with Mm -hmm. which in that situation, I I don't think you need, uh, as a police officer, you should be able to handle that situation anyway. So I I don't know, uh, why they would need to kill somebody in that, uh, situation. But what I'm saying is What's really fucked up about this, and I hope this is what people get out of this show, is that we don't need, not that we need this to happen, but Germany, Nazi Germany doesn't have to take over for the country to be similar to it, because it already is. 
So when you look at the show and the show is extreme and yes, it is worse. So there's no doubt that it's worse. But if you were to look at it from the standpoint of do these things happen, maybe they happen at a much lower percentage or they don't happen to that many people. But do these things happen? And looking at it, and I'd have to really think about it and maybe even rewatch the shows, but off the top of my head, I think everything that has happened in the show has happened in reality as well as a result of the U.S. government. And that, to me, is the scariest part of the show. And that's also what I hope people get out of it. Because I hope people don't watch the show and think, oh, well, I'm glad we don't live under their rule, because look at that. I hope people look at it and realize that, fuck, we're not that far off. That if we don't do something we're going to be closer to that. And, you know, I guess if I had to rate it from a one to a 10 off the top of my head, you know, 10 being the most like it, I don't know. I'd say maybe a six. I think it also depends where you live. So I'm taking the country as a whole because a lot of these things go on. They just don't happen all the time and happen to everybody. So because they don't happen all the time and happen to everybody, people think that, well, so America is still free because this just happens occasionally or something like that. I, I don't know. To me, if there's certain things that go on, I don't know how a country can be free when the government murders its own citizens. Never mind what they do to other countries. So, and I'm not even talking about that. I'm just talking about what they do to their own citizens. So... I hope uh, if you have Amazon, definitely watch it. It's free with Amazon Prime. Um, It's called The Man in the High Castle. And season one is all out there, all 10 episodes. And tomorrow we will be having Ken Shorjan on to talk about the economy and geopolitics. Maybe he'll have some news on the shooting that took place today. And uh, I guess we'll have to see. I'll have to check if he uh, wrote any articles about it. But it happened uh, later today. So, Well, it happened earlier today, but it seems like all the information got out later today. So... So thanks, everybody, for tuning in. The The two people that tuned in, um, thank you. Uh, I appreciate it. And to all the haters out there that are bad-mouthing the show or, um, you know, talking whatever shit, you know, whatever, I guess, the haters are going to hate. Right, what was that song from? That was like an older um, R. Kelly. Anyway, so we'll be back tomorrow, 7 o'clock Pacific, 10 o'clock Eastern. And we'll be back again with uh, Ken Chorjan. 
the economy, geopolitics, and Ken is always great when he's on the show. So thanks, everybody. Listen to police officers' commands, listen to what we tell you, and just stop. The nation needs to realize that when we tell you to do something, do it. And if you're wrong, you're wrong. If you're right, then the courts will figure it out. We don't get to take it. We force it. And at the end of the day, each and every man can go home safe. Sometimes the use of force is necessary. You need to comply with the police officer the way the system was meant to be. Comply with the orders of police officers. Resisting arrest is a real and dangerous thing.